Good evening. Hi again. Thank you so much for coming out. My name is Tracy Matthews. I'm the executive director of the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture here at the University of Chicago. And on behalf of the center and the Human Rights Lab at the Posen Family Center for Human Rights and the National Book Foundation, we'd like to welcome you to tonight's event, Literature for Justice, Exploring America's Carceral System. I would like to thank all the people who made this event possible, the Human Rights Lab staff, Ashley Pierce, Calvin Wilder, Ayo Idowu, Michael Fisher, Kristen Ginsky, um, the Center for Study of Race, Politics, and Culture staff, Marilyn Willis, Julius Jones, and Kate Liu. And of course, thank you to the National Book Foundation for reaching out to us and letting us host this program uh, here on campus. I also want to thank our um, crew that's documenting the event. Sarah G is doing photos back there, and on the reel are our videographers. And I would also like to thank Carmela Snook from SSA, who is their uh, events coordinator, and uh, she helped us get this all together, and we really appreciate you being here and um, doing all the work you've done to get this together. So I guess when we were first approached by the National Book Foundation, um, I think some folks around us thought, well, what does literature have to do with this mass incarceration epidemic? What does it have to do with social justice? And, and I think that um, it, it caused us to think about what is the role of artists and writers in social justice movements? And what is the connection between literature and public policy? And I just wanted to share a little story about something that happened yesterday. Uh, Angela Davis was in town yesterday for a graduation at Stateville Prison, which is a maximum security prison. And um, some of our faculty members and advanced graduate students teach classes there. And we uh, partner with the Prison and Neighborhood Arts Project to offer arts classes, but also uh, political science and history classes. So they had a graduation yesterday, and they got Angela Davis to come. So that was pretty spectacular. I mean, you know, Chance the Rapper was there, but and the lieutenant governor, but who cares? <laughs> um, so anyway, Angela was talking. We, we had that conversation about the role of lawyers and attorneys in, in her case and other folks. And she was saying that, you know, the best lawyers she had were also artists. And so, you know, there's definitely a connection between the art we produce, the literature we produce, and the ways in which we can move people to make social change. So I'm excited to hear our authors tonight, and um, I'm going to stop talking and invite Alice Kim, who is the director of the Human Rights Lab at the Posen Family Center for Human Rights. How's everyone doing? Good. 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 I want to echo Tracy's thanks to the National Book Foundation, uh, to everyone who helped organize tonight's program, to Gina Fedak, who is here, who saved the day and helped us get this fabulous space to hold this event uh, tonight, um, and of course to Tracy um, and the Race Center, um, and all of you for being here. It's a beautiful day outside, and it's a beautiful day to talk about mass incarceration. Uh, it's an issue, really, that touches all of us and every single one of us, um, and it really is, I think, one of the most urgent um, pressing issues of, of the day. Yesterday, I had the honor of participating in the very special ceremony that took place at Stateville um, Prison. Uh, as Tracy mentioned, a maximum security prison for men. I teach with the Prison Neighborhood Arts Project, and uh, we partnered with University Without Walls at Northeastern Illinois University. And our first cohort of students Earned, graduated yesterday and earned uh, their bachelor's degrees. So they are the first. They are the first in two decades to earn uh, bachelor's degrees um, from behind the prison wall in Illinois. So it is quite an accomplishment um, for them and. 
during those hours when we were able to celebrate um, their accomplishments and really celebrate um, all of the accomplishments that take place behind the prison wall that many of us don't know about, don't hear about. During those few hours, uh, you, those few hours really masked the inhumanity um, of the prison, right? Because we were there, Angela Davis gave uh, an incredible speech about moving beyond the punishment paradigm and moving beyond prisons um, and the need to the need to look at alternatives to incarceration. The lieutenant governor also talked about learning from those who um, society really has discarded and are considered um, disposable. She talked about the need to learn from those who are behind prison walls um, to advance criminal justice uh, reform. And then Chance the Rapper performed <laughs> and asked us all to, to believe in hope, to believe in ourselves and to believe in miracles. And so during those few hours, um, there was hope behind the prison wall. Uh, there was a sense of community, and it was a real reminder that really no one is disposable, and we have to refuse the logic of the carceral state that says that there are disposable communities. So for the men in our classes, um, and really for all people who are locked up, books are a lifeline um, to a world um, beyond the prison. And that's why we're so thrilled to be able to um, have this program uh, tonight. And I just wanted to share the words of James Baldwin uh, to uh, welcome all of you and to introduce tonight's program. Uh, James Baldwin said this, you think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read. It was books that taught me that the things that tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive or who had ever been alive. So I want to thank the National Book Foundation for uh, doing this program, this Literature for Justice um, program, and bringing these books um, all to cities all across the country. So with that, I will welcome Beth Harrison, the Deputy Director of the National Book Foundation. Hi, everyone. Good evening. So glad to see you all. I, too, have a lot of people to thank, and it's really worth thanking people again and again, so I hope you'll bear with me. Tracy and Alice, thank you so much. Thank you to uh, Carmela and Sid and Ashley and everyone who we corresponded with back at our office in New York and helped pull all this together. It was, a, it was no small feat. We're grateful to our hosts, the University of Chicago, specifically the great teams and wonderful partners at the Human Rights Lab, Posen Family Center for Human Rights, Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, and the School of Social Service Administration. We also want to thank the Art for Justice Fund and the Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors who gave us the opportunity to create this program, Literature for Justice, in the first place. They allowed us to engage with their mission, which is really essentially ending mass incarceration and for us to, to try to have a lens on that through literature. To start, I'd like to give you just a quick overview of the National Book Foundation. Our mission is to celebrate the best literature in America, expand its audience, and ensure that books have a prominent place in American culture. I think we're most well known, if people know of us, uh, for the National Book Awards, which will celebrate their 70th anniversary this year. Um, but we also do a lot of educational programs around the country like this, and also things that are quite different uh, from this. We uh, have a program called Book Rich Environments, which is an, an, an initiative that in just three years will have provided one million free books to children and families living in public housing. We have something called National Book Foundation Presents, which is a program that brings National Book Award honored authors to universities, community colleges, libraries, and festivals across the US to read their work and meet new friends. Uh, we also have something called Book Up, which is a writer-led, essentially it's a, it's a book club for middle school students. It's after school, and it's held during the summer, and we have so many more programs, but that just gives you a little bit of a window on what we do that is beyond a book award and beyond this program here tonight, um, which is all to say that all of us in our office, on our board, in our community believe books matter. We believe that books hold the power to help illuminate our world, and it's uh, this mission that we have that leads us directly to create literature for justice. This program, in our minds, uh, seeks to contextualize, humanize, 
and render more understandable the causes and effects of mass incarceration in the United States. This is just year one of a three-year initiative, and uh, we have a cohort of well-known authors who are also experts, thought leaders, and tireless advocates in this field who have come together to form what we are calling the Literature for Justice Committee. It's a very innovative name. And uh, they are selecting the Literature for Justice reading list. So try to keep it simple and straightforward. The five books that um, were selected this year that are intended to guide the readers through the complexities of our justice system are Understanding Mass Incarceration, by James Kilgore, Inside This Place, Not Of It, which is edited by Robin Levy and Ayelet Waldman, A Place to Stand by Jimmy Santiago Baca, Shahid Reads His Own Palm by Reginald Dwayne Betts, and Upstate, which is a novel by Kalisha Buchanan. Did I hear some snaps? I hope so. In my world, we do a lot of poetry snaps. <laughs> I love it. So again, our goal in creating this program is to really help shift public perception and understanding of mass incarceration through the power of storytelling. Um, a lot of the books that were selected um, include first person accounts and we think that that is uh, hugely important. Also accompanied with you know, the history, where, we're gonna come, where we've come from, why we are, um, as Sergio de la Pava said to me earlier tonight, um, so good at this horrible thing in this country, which is incarcerating people. At the end of three years, we'll have 15 books that we're going to promote um, individually and as a whole, um, and we hope that they will tell, and we know that they do tell, a collective story about one of what we believe is the most critical issues of our time. So it is my pleasure, without much further ado, to introduce tonight's participants. The Literature for Justice Committee member who is, is representing uh, his fellow members uh, tonight, Sergio de la Pava, is the author of three novels, A Naked Singularity, Personae, and Lost Empress. He's also a lifelong public defender and legal director at New York County Defender Services in Manhattan, where he represents indigent uh, criminal defendants and advocates for large-scale criminal justice reform. In conversation with Sergio tonight is Robin Levy, James Kilgore. Robin, again, is an editor with Ayala Waldman of Inside This Place, Not Of It, Narratives from Women's Prison, which tells the stories of 13 women inside the American prison system. Robin's a consultant working in the field of human rights, and she's the former human rights director at Justice Now. While she was a staff attorney at the Women's Rights Division of Human Rights Watch, she documented sexual abuse of women in U.S. prisons. She currently works with low-income, high-achieving students to help them get into college. And finally, James Kilgore is an activist, writer, and researcher based very nearby in Urbana, Illinois. He's the author of Understanding Mass Incarceration, A People's Guide to the Key Civil Rights Struggle of Our Time. He's also published four novels, all of which were drafted during his six and a half years in prison. His current focus is campaigning against the proliferation of electronic monitoring in the criminal legal system, which he calls e-carceration. In his current hometown, he is co-director of First Followers Reentry Program. Please welcome our participants to the stage. Thank you so much, and thank you everybody for coming. I really, we really appreciate it. You know, when the National Book Foundation first approached me with this concept that we're hearing about, the literature for justice, uh, I, I must confess that even as somebody who is very active in both worlds, I didn't quite see the connection. It wasn't the most intuitive uh, coupling for me um, to think of literature and tend to also think of legal reform and mass incarceration. But over the course of almost the next year, I mean, I think nothing could make more sense. I think the mass incarceration program that this country has been um, engaged in for about four decades relies and continues to rely on secrecy and um, disinterest by the average citizen. And so books like the five that, um, that Beth mentioned and the two that we're talking about today um, by the two authors to my right um, what they do is they lift the veil of secrecy. I want to talk about how, that, how they do that and how they do that so skillfully. But that's where I think the, the connection between literature, between writing, between art, and, um, and the need to engage in this civil rights struggle is most pronounced. So I'm, I'm very grateful to have been a part of this for almost a year. I'm very grateful to Robin and James for joining us today because I think these two books uh, brilliantly personify what we're talking about. And I'm gonna start um, by asking you guys to each read from, from your books um, as, as a way to start. If James, you could start. Hello, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Sergio, and thanks to 
the National Book Foundation and to everyone who's helped put this uh, event together and bring the attention to the issue of mass incarceration. So uh, I, uh, I like to read the inscription of this particular copy of my book because it's the one I gave to my mother. Dear mom, thanks to all your love and support over the years, I can keep writing books. You are the best. Love, Jim. <laughs> so <laughs> she taught me the meaning of unconditional love. She supported me for 27 years of being a fugitive. And I don't usually break down like this, but it's OK. And I, what I usually ask people to do when I do do this is to clap for a minute, and it helps me uh, regain my uh, composure. <laughs> so she, she passed away at 104 in uh, 2018. So I had uh, a good bit of time with her after my period of incarceration. So I'll talk a little bit later about how I came to write this book, but I, I want to just say that it's you know in sort of the the genre of literature, it's a textbook, it's a primer, which isn't really what people tend to think of when we talk about literature. But I, I, I wanted to shape this a little bit differently, so I've included a lot of voice of people who are impacted, who have experienced incarceration. So I'm gonna read two short excerpts from, from those voices and then a little bit from my own conclusion. So this is from a document from 1970, in, uh, the Bill of Rights of the United Prisoners Union. We, the people of the convicted class locked in a cycle of poverty, failure, discrimination, and servitude do hereby declare before the world our situation to be unjust and inhuman. Basic human rights are systematically withheld from our class. We have been historically stereotyped as less than human, while in reality we possess the same needs, frailties, ambitions, and dignity indigenous to all humans. Our class has been unconstitutionally denied equal treatment under the law. We hereby assert before the tribunal of mankind that our class ought not to be subject to one whit more restraint nor one ounce more deprivation than is essential to implementing the constructive purposes of criminal law. So that's really like the first wave of, 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 of self-organization by incarcerated people, um, the United Prisoners Union trying to form an organization of incarcerated people, which we have seen resurrected in the, in the recent um, prison labor strikes, um, in, first in the hunger strikes in California and later in the national strikes in uh, Texas, Alabama, um, South Carolina, and other places. The second, the second piece I want to read is, is, is from a, a, a young woman who, whose mother was incarcerated. And I think it's important that we recognize that it's not just the people who are locked up that are impacted by incarceration, but it's their family members and their, and their communities. And those stories are often forget, forgotten, and they're usually stories of female partners, grandmothers, mothers, daughters, w women who bear the, the burden of incarceration when the 90% of people who are incarcerated are, are in men's prisons. There's burdens of administration, there's burdens of emotion, there's, burden, there's financial burdens, and those all must be borne by the people who are left behind. So I think this is pretty powerful by Sayadina Thomas, whose mother was incarcerated. She said, I didn't know I had rights. I thought I was worthless, somebody without a family that nobody cared for. I felt that whenever someone cared about me, I owed them my life. If somebody gave me a meal that was more than top ramen, I, I thought they had done me a favor. I didn't want to accept help because I felt I'd owed a debt I couldn't pay, not realizing that care was my right as a child. So I think that's pretty strong. And I mean, from my own, from my own experience of my, of, of my children who, who had much more support than than a, than a lot of children of incarcerated people, still the you know the trauma was was very was very real. So this is the last par the last couple paragraphs of my book, my text. 
Mark Maurer, director of the sentencing project, estimated in 2014 that at the rate of decrease in the prison population from 2009 to 2012, it would take 88 years to reach the per capita incarceration rate of 1980. Clearly too long. Maurer's scenario raises another question. Can mass incarceration be ended without a massive release of people from prisons and jails? Even if such a mass release did take place, when could we actually pronounce mass incarceration dead? Is Maurer's reference point, 1980, the goal? Has it ended when all the harsh sentencing laws are off the books? When racial bias has been removed from our police and court practices? When a certain number of prisons and jails have been closed down? When everyone on parole or probation is employed and adequately housed? Or is an end to mass incarceration more a spiritual or philosophical tipping point beyond which criminal justice focuses on developing human beings and creating opportunities for communities rather than punishing criminals who are regarded as second-class citizens? Is it a moment when youth of color feel free to walk down the street without worrying about harassment or arrest and when women or transgender folks have no fear of physical or sexual violence? For some people, Mass incarceration may not end until every prison is shuttered, until the United States has become a society where even those guilty of the most harmful acts are given the opportunity for redemption and to be treated with the respect all human beings deserve. For the moment, the United States remains a long way from an end to mass incarceration. Understanding how the system works, in particular, who wins and who loses from the largest expansion of carceral facilities in human history is an important starting point, but there is much more to be done. So as you've heard, again, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you National Book Foundation, thank you University of Chicago, thank you Sergio and James, just thank you everybody, because I know it, it's crazy beautiful outside and I hear it hasn't been that way um, recently. I'm from California, so I can joke like that, right? So I wanted to read, as Beth said, my book is, uh, the, the book is a collection of 13 narratives. Um, I want to apologize, because I didn't catch this. They actually aren't all from women. They are all from women's prisons, but not all of the people in the book um, identify as women. And I picked this um, selection, I'm not gonna read all of it, but um, just a few pieces of it, not because it's the most horrible story in the book, because it's actually not. It's not the most horrible story in the book, it's not the most horrible story I know. Um, but because um, it deals with issues around reproductive justice and reproductive capacity, which I think is so prevalent and such a huge issue in the women's prisons, I wanted to highlight that. And it also talks a little bit about the community, which is a huge issue, I think, in all prisons, but I know especially in the women's prisons. Okay. The gyne that gynecologist was the only one we had at the prison. With all 4,000 women, if there was anything wrong, you'd go and see him. Usually you form some type of relationship with your doctor, but that's not how it was there. It was more like number X, lay down here, put your legs up in the stirrups. There is no getting to know you or your needs and wants. The gynecologist referred me to a surgeon at the local hospital outside the prison. I had to wait a few more months for the pre-op so we could discuss what the treatments were going to be. The surgeon explained to me that he was going to be doing surgery to remove the cysts and that he was going to be doing a cone biopsy on me to find out whether or not I had cervical cancer. Based on the findings, if any forms of cancer were found within my cervix or in my uterine wall, then I'd be looking at a hysterectomy or a partial hysterectomy. So I was basically consenting to the fact that if they found cancer, they had the permission to remove part or all of my uterus. There was a lot of debate as to what happened to me when I woke up out of surgery, but I do remember bits and pieces. I do remember asking what happened to me, and they told me I just had a cone biopsy and a removal of the cysts. There was another girl in the hospital room recovering with me. She'd overheard some things that were going on, and she was a little bit more alert than I was. She said, I believe that you had the same surgery as me, a full hysterectomy, but that wasn't what the doctors told me. I never got my period again after that surgery. For the next few years, I was still asking at the prison why I didn't have my menstrual cycle. I was told that sometimes these things happen, that maybe my body just shut down or went through shock, or that maybe the trauma of the surgery caused surgical menopause. All the discharge papers in the hospital said that I had had a cystinectomy, one on one or, uh, ovary the size, 
one on the other over that size and that a cone biopsy had been done. I was waiting and hoping for my cycle to start back again, waiting for my body to kick start. But my body was really shutting down and I couldn't understand why. I didn't learn what happened until four or five years later when an organization called Justice Now started looking into my case. Through their investigation, I finally found out that during the surgery, the surgeon had cut off the blood supply to my ovaries, killing them instantly. Instead of trying other techniques or offering me alternative measures to go about this procedure, he'd just gone in and just snap, left me with no ovaries. Then after the cone biopsy, he'd sewn me up and never talked to me about it at all. He never sat in the side of my bed and actually took the time to tell me what procedure had been formed to me and why. Before the surgery, he'd even asked me if I wanted to have more children. I'd said, yeah, I'm hoping to find somebody one day who loves me. I didn't get a chance to raise my other son, so I want the chance for a family again. He didn't listen to me. She also, um, and I should say before I read the second piece, so she was um, in prison for 15 years for um, killing her abuser um, because she was in fear of her life. There were 4,000 women there, eight women to a room, 32 rooms in each building, four buildings in each yard. I knew a lot of people there from school and from fighting their cases with me in county. That's where the bond is built. Nowadays, I watch a lot of war movies and I can see a lot of what I went through in prison. It's the same thing. You have a band of brothers, a band of sisters. It was more settled than in county jail. Jail is more like, please God, get me out of this situation. I don't want to be here. But once you get to prison, you've already gone through that process. You've been settling in. Then it's like, please God, give me the strength to get through the situation. I don't want to die here. I had a crew that was between the ages of 17 and 19, and they all came in facing 35 to life, 55 to life, life without the possibility of parole. They became my sisters. We were fighting for our lives together. Nowadays, when I see some of those girls out in the street, I get so excited. I don't even get that excited when I see family members I haven't seen in years. But when we see each other, it's like, what do you need? We do anything for each other. For each other. The shirt come off your back, the shoes come off your feet, the money comes out of the purse. You say, come on, girl, I got $5. Let's go to McDonald's. At least we can get two hamburgers, two fries, and share some cookies. James, um, you mentioned on the book, Understanding Mass Incarceration, a People's Guide to this Key Civil Rights Struggle of Our Time. You said it was kind of like a textbook, um, which I think is giving it short shrift because I don't remember textbooks being this compelling and skillfully done. But tell me about... The, the original idea to proceed in this fashion, because it is, it is a unique way of tackling the subject. And, and I'm just interested in, in the kind of the germs of thought that resulted in you uh, deciding to proceed in this manner. Okay, uh, well, when I was in high desert state prison in California, I got lots of literature, because I, I mean, I had connections, I'd done research before. I mean, I was a reader, right? And as people said, you know, for people in prison, books are sort of like the connection to the, to the, to the world outside. And, but so many, so many of the books that I got, I couldn't share with most of the people, or in some cases, not even any of the people that, that I was locked up with, because they were too dense. They were academic, they had, they had, you know, 112 pages of references at the end, and they had all the things that put, that, you know, block people who didn't go through higher education from, from actually digesting things. And, and in the California prisons, there was no PNAP. <laughs> there was no, there was nobody ever came into any of the prisons I was in from outside the prison to do education, not one single solitary person. And so I thought to myself, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I thought to myself as, as I got, when I got out, I want to write something that make sense of this system of mass incarceration because people are living this experience, but they don't always have the analytical tools to unpack what exactly is happening. And this was a new experience when I came to prison. I had been in South, Southern Africa for 18 years before that. I had no idea about mass incarceration. And then I just saw this string of bodies coming through the gates, you know, doing the kind of sentences you just mentioned, and we call them football numbers. Um, and and it didn't make any sense to me. So as I unpacked it, I thought, well, the people around me don't have a systematic understanding of how this works. And in order to fight back, in order to resist this, we need that systematic understanding. And we need the people inside who are directly impacted to be able to, to have that understanding and take it forward to organize. So I came, I mean, I came up with this idea of writing a book. Now, I'd written a lot of 
popular education materials before for trade unions and for community organizations in Southern Africa. So it was kind of a method that I knew from before, but I wanted this to be in accessible language. I wanted it to present different points of view and encapsulate some of the key debates. But most of all, I wanted it to include a lot of the voices, rather than the voices of academic experts, the voices of people from inside prison and their family members and people who advocated for them. So that's kind of the genesis of that, yeah. It's absolutely brilliant, and I think um, it, it should be, uh, and if it is already, but it, it should continue to be kind of a foundational text for anybody who, who wants to educate themselves on what's truly going on um, in this country as it comes to its crime and punishment. Uh, Robin, uh, inside this place, not of it, is also, I think, unique in the dignity that it affords to the writers that are in this book. Um, and I'm, I'm also curious, I think that was a brilliant insight to see the storytelling to the people who have directly experienced it, who probably, my guess, for the first time in their lives were feeling like they were being heard. Um, so tell us about the genesis of, of, of proceeding in this fashion, which I think is also a unique way of tackling. Well, I think um, definitely part of it is, and one thing I want, I want to give a shout out to Voice of Witness, because this, is a, this book is a series in a series of Voice of Witness, and they are built upon doing oral narratives. Um, which, which is really, really powerful. The reason why Ayala and I sought out <laughs> Voice of Witness and said, please, you have to do this book, is that, uh, you know, and I want actually, I want to mention a little bit, because I know there's maybe some human rights activists in, in the room. As a, as a human rights attorney, I spent a lot of time focusing on the abuse that occurred. And you talk about what is the specific abuse, and you talk about that abuse, and you spend a lot of time in the abuse. What we really wanted to do in this process was to, and Sergio alluded to it, the invisibility of what's going on inside prisons. The number of people in women's prisons has, has skyrocketed under uh, you know, mandatory minimums and our increased focus on criminal justice and all the process of the mass incarceration. It has um, increased by eight, nine, ten times in some cases the number of folks in women's prisons. And, and those folks are largely invisible and largely um, voiceless. And so we really wanted to give the folks inside an opportunity to tell their story. And not just the story about the abuse that happened to them, but the full, their full story, their full piece of who they are, um, what, what their life was like, what brought them inside, and in the cases when they had left, what has happened to them since they've left prison? What has happened to them in their journey? And, and I would say like, it was such a privilege for me to be able to do that because I hadn't been able to really spend that time with folks inside and, and, and explore their full live spectrum. And so that's really what it came from, was really this desire to have people get a better sense of what's really going on inside prison and who are these people really and give the folks inside a voice because um, the prisons, and we can talk about this more, spend a lot, a lot of time and energy in ensuring that we can't hear the voices of people inside. James, why don't we take a moment to define our terms. We're all throwing around the term mass incarceration. So in, in like 1973, for those of you who don't know, there's about 200,000 or 230,000 people incarcerated in this country. And today, and pretty, the number's pretty, pretty steadily holding at about 2.3 million. Um, so just a wild increase at the same time that certainly violent crime has dropped significantly. So you do this in the book. Explain to us what you think happened or th that caused that, that seven-fold increase. Well, uh, m most people, when they think of mass incarceration, they think it's the phenomenon of locking up a lot of people. And, and, and that's part of it, but that, that, to me, that's not what it is. It's a decision you know, by U.S. capitalism and the leaders of U.S. capitalism to adopt a different approach to how we solve social problems. And so how do we solve the problem of homelessness? We undertake a massive public housing program known as prison and jail building. How do we solve problems of mental health? We close mental health facilities. We lock people up that have mental health uh, issues. How do we solve uh, problems of substance abuse? The same, the same formula. Uh, applies. So we shift our resources from, from some kind of social welfare system and support to punishment. And this thing coincides, and I think it's really important to 
kind of get the historical part of this, it coincides with a crisis of global capitalism, which we call globalization, which came hand in hand with the advance of neoliberalism, an individualistic ideology where we, we, we de-emphasize working together, building community, and we put forward the idea of individual success and individualism as the, as, as the ultimate measure of, of, how, you know, of, how we, of how we move forward. So there's a, there's a major philosophical change which takes place really when, when Reagan and Thatcher come to power and they implement this at a global level. But the particular manifestation of it in the United States is extreme. So although most European countries also have adopted some form of mass incarceration, and some Latin American countries have, no, no other country has taken it to the extreme that the, that, that, that the United States has. So, and that has to do, I think, with, the, with two aspects of US history. One is the excessive sort of militaristic, imperialistic kind of history. And secondly, still the legacy of slavery and settler colonialism. So we're still, we still haven't resolved those issues and they become manifest in, in the decisions about who we make up, about who we lock up. So that's a, that's a long-winded explanation, but I don't think it's a simple process. And to just say it's about jails and prisons, it's not about jails and prisons, it's about what kind of a society we have, what kind of a political economy we have. But do you think that there was, was overt decision making? I mean, one of the elements you include in the book, which I found incredibly, I didn't know this, but is I think it's a quote of Richard Nixon saying something like, well, the real problem here is the blacks, and we can't say that that's what we're doing, but let's call them, let's call it being tough on crime, or let's, you know, the way labels get used to hide true purposes or to hide genuine uh, uh, maleficence by saying, let's call it about being tough on crime, but the ulterior motive was clear from the outset, it seems. Yeah, to I mean, totally, that, you know, that, there, was, there was that targeting, and that targeting also took place as a form of backlash against the social movements of the 60s and 70s, the black liberation movement, women's liberation movement, as it was called, gay liberation movement, the, you know, the fight for farm worker rights, a whole range of Native American land rights. All these were things that shook the, the, the kind of dominant culture to its roots. And part of what happened in the 1980s was a backlash uh, to punish the people who were seen to be leading that. And that, you know, that was largely black people and people of color more generally. Robin, there are 13 um, stories or, or writers, I'm gonna call them, in, uh, featured in, in the book. Is it fair to say you interviewed more than 13 people? Um, we, um, we interviewed people in four, 14 states, so already you know more than 13, and I think we ended interviewing around 30 to 40 people. And we weren't able, obviously, to share all of the narrators um, stories and have all of them included because, um, you know, and this actually gets back to the difficulty of doing it. When I came into this, I thought, I mean, I go to conferences all the time and I, I do all those things. I knew there was a ton of, peop of, of folks inside women's prisons who had compelling things to tell us. It was incredibly, incredibly hard to do this. It was between the prisons not letting us inside or if we got into the prisons, they would not let us bring any recording equipment or um, any way in which to document the um, the words that were coming out from from coming from the women. Um, one story um, my my co-editor Ayala always like talk about is that the only thing they would let you into the California prisons was the mini disc, which is you know no one knows what that is. It was out of it's out of production, and so we had interns just trying to corner the market on eBay so that we would have enough of these mini discs because you couldn't, once you open it, you can't use it again. So it was just this ridiculous process. And then many prisons wouldn't let us in at all, right? If you weren't an attorney, and even if they were an attorney, you couldn't come in. And, um, and that put a lot of hurdles. Then we started work trying to write to folks inside, and which is, Voice of Witness had never done that before. They had never had it not be face to face. But we said we have to, we can't under these circumstances. There's too many people who are reaching out to us and want to be included that we're not going to be able to include. And um, and we were asked to write. So in one case, and this is Colorado where the ACLU I think is still suing them for their. Um, we sent in um, stamped envelopes with paper because that seems respectful because they're going to have to 
um, it, this costs money. And the, the prison confiscated that and said, if we ever sent st stamped, um, stamped addressed envelopes in again with paper, that um, the, 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 folk, the person we were working with was not going to get any of our letters. And we'd be cut off from ever contacting him. Um, and I say all that. We did actually, one of, the, one of the narratives in here was done with us writing back and forth. And that was just such a blessing to be able to have her words included. I say that to say that we were not able to include many of the testimonies because we could never finish them. You know, we'd get the first piece and we weren't, then we weren't able to get back inside to talk to them. Then we were cut off. Um, and so it was, it ended up being huge you know, for me. And I say this as a person who, right, what, 15 years I've been working in, inside prisons, inside California's prisons, which are notoriously some of, the, one, some of the best at not letting any information out. It was actually shocking to me how hard it was to, to get this information and to, and to talk to folks. Um, I should also say that having people want to be part of this pro process was never a problem. Um, everyone that we reached out to was eager to spend four to five hours and more speaking to us often, as you said, first time telling their stories and, and really talking about just their entire lives. They were all eager to do it. In one case, one, one, one um, woman who, whose story is included in here, that was her first stop. She got out of prison, got to the halfway house. Her first stop was a coffee shop to do her interview and to start this. She said, I want to get this done and get my words out here. That was one of, um, I think that was heartening to me to see just so much energy and love um, from all of the people who participated and wanted to participate. But there was a huge, huge oh my gosh. I mean, it was like I said, I, I'm, I, I should know better, but I was still surprised. I'm not surprised that you bring up all these barriers. In my experience, like departments of corrections or penal institutes are never more upset than when you treat their inmates with like dignity. <laughs> if you send them a book, they get offended. If you, and in your case, where you're trying to, um, in essence, include them in a book, I can only imagine the resistance you met. Um, I want to read a quote um, from Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson is, I think he's the director of Equal Justice Initiative. Um, and he said, and, and this is in, in James's book, uh, you quote him. He argues that, quote, mass incarceration defines us as a society the way slavery once did. On that. Well, I, th I mean, I think the fact that we, as, as you put it earlier, we're the best in the world at, uh, at incarcerating says, says pretty, pretty much something about how we value the, 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 the population. And I think it, and the, the attitude toward poor people, the criminalization of poverty is, is I mean, it's uniquely severe in the U.S. In, at least among the industrialized countries. And so I think, yes, it defines, it does define the US. And when people from outside the US look at this prison system here, they're, they're, they're baffled. They're baffled at the extent, how can this industrialized country that's supposed to be a democracy be locking up all these people? And how can they get away with locking up so many black people, you know, a disproportionate amount of black people, and there's apparently no accountability for this. I mean, the, th the thing that's really disturbing about this whole process is, I mean, uh, def it's, it's defined, but it was invisible, as you pointed out. It was invisible for, I mean, it's been going on for four decades, but it was invisible for three. I mean, no, no, I mean when I came out of prison and I talked to people about mass incarceration, they, looked at, they didn't know what I was talking about. And then a few people got to, he, familiar with the term and they said, Ah, oh, it's James going on about that shit. He's still hung up on prison, you know. So it took really until the early teens before we began to see a, a, an awareness of this as a, you know as a, as as a as a as a phenomenon as something that was central to the character of the United States. It was kept invisible, kept secret. It wasn't kept secret to impacted communities, but it was kept secret. It, I'm sure they didn't talk about mass incarceration in this institution for years and years and years, and in the University of Illinois for years and years and years. Maybe a few people, but the institution as a whole, you, I mean, I, I, I'm, I have to have my little rave here. I always do this when I get in these, what I call bubbles of intellectual privilege, and that sit in the middle of, of black communities, and the people in these universities don't cross the street. 
because they're afraid of what they're going to find there. And they're told they're going to find things they don't want there. And even in Champaign, Illinois, we have University Avenue that runs right down Champaign and Urbana. And on one side, you have the black community. And on the other side, you have the university. And that's it. We have 70% black people in our jail, 13% black people in our county. And it's a you know, it's a global university, a world-class university. That's my rave on universities. When are universities going to take up the issue of mass incarceration, the incarceration and the poverty that exists right in their neighborhood? When are they going to take action on that? I know there's people that do that, but when is the institution itself? What, how much is the how much is the the endowment at University of Chicago? It's three billion, or two billion, three billion in Illinois. It's probably they probably got a twenty thirty dollar, twenty billion dollar. Uh, endowment here. Where is that money going? Sorry for the rave. <laughs> no, there was, ab there was absolutely no attention being given to this issue, as you said, up until probably five years ago. Would be, would be, I, when I say, I mean, when, I, when my wife and I started as public defenders in New York City, people would say to us things like, oh, you couldn't find another job, huh? That's a terrible thing to have to be doing. Now it's, how can I get into your office to join this righteous cause? Which is great. Better late than never, but I, I, it's still a bit of, there's still an underlying resentment. Uh, the thing that struck me, Robin, uh, was the way that incarceration, whether mass or not, just incarceration, allows you, um, society to treat human beings as less than human. Um, it's legalized discrimination. And that's the theme, I think, in these 13 stories, and even in what you read tonight. Of, of things being done to human beings as if they weren't deserving of even the most basic human rights. And if called on it, I think the people doing it would say, well, they're criminals, they brought this upon themselves. This kind of mass media that James refers to so skillfully in his book, this kind of mass media brainwashing about cr other, otherizing criminals and why what they get is what they deserve. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely. And I think, I mean, it was so interesting when James was describing mass incarceration and this concept that now we're not going to, you know, put our money into these social programs. We're going to put it into building more prisons. And that was really compelling to me because that's one of the things that we've seen in that the, the, you look at, you read these narratives and these are, are people that the, like our society basically broke in various ways. And then rather than trying to do anything about it, was like, we're gonna toss them in prison and break them some more, but we're certainly not gonna think about it. And um, one piece that was really, um, and this again, like my co-editor was a public defender. I've been doing this work for a long, very, very long time. And I knew the statistics as to the numbers of people who, of people inside women's prisons who had been sexually abused. And the number we usually would cite, and I said used to cite, would be about Two thirds, two thirds of the people inside women's prisons have experienced either sexual or physical violence. When we started doing this, none of the folks that we selected to be interviewed were selected because of their experience of sexual abuse. It was they were selected based on the abuse that they experienced inside prison. Every single one of them in the process told us about sexual abuse. And sexual abuse childhood by the staff. In, no, childhood sexual oh, okay. abuse prior to coming, prior, excuse me, childhood sexual abuse prior to coming inside prison. Every single one of them. And, you know, in our current system, it's a whole lot cheaper to get heroin than good health care, right? So they didn't, they didn't get any help for that trauma that they experienced. And, and in so many of those cases, you can see that line to whatever it is that they did you know, to get them inside. And then once they're inside, you know, so they're already, by being in all the, almost all the people inside this um, narrative were, were low income, um, were already in that sense thrown away. Um, and then once they're inside, they're thrown away even more as we talked about with the reproductive capacity. And I have never seen people treat other people's reproductive capacity as cavalierly as the prison system. And yes, I, I, it's not in the book, but um, to your point, Sergio, we have had clients had that told to them. So one woman, when, when pregnant, asked, you know, the, they're doing the ultrasound, and she said, well, how does the baby look? And the response was, if you cared, you wouldn't have gotten into prison. You know, other folks, when they're inside, they were told that it didn't matter what happened in terms of hysterectomy or ophorectomy because they had a life sentence. So their reproductive capacity didn't matter. 
And, and this definitely, um, to a large extent, I have to be honest, did fall down racial lines. Every single person who had had a coerced or for, forced hysterectomy or ophorectomy was black or brown. There was um, one person who was of Asian descent, but she, um, she was Filipina and so per was perceived as being Latina. So when she was going into surgery, that was the hysterectomy, they asked her if she needed a translator, a Spanish translator. And she's like, why? Um, at which point, that's when she realized that. And she was, and this is my last thing, you had a little rant, I'm gonna give my, my little baby rant. She was the, the, the second of the two people that had a hysterectomy based on a diagnosis of cervical cancer that it then turned out they did not have. Um, and so that's, that tells you the, the, the level of respect that the folks inside women's prisons and their reproductive capacity and their humanity, right? Because all this is all wrapped into your humanity was treated. It was treated as, as nothing. Maybe a way to get a little extra cash from doing a hysterectomy, which will give you a little extra cash if you're a doctor. I'm gonna put that out there. And, and we've been focusing on, and, and the books focus on incarceration, but I think, as James hinted at earlier, um, when you're talking about 2.3 million people in, being incarcerated, somebody in, in, in the book says something like, it turns out to be true, like when a member of your family goes to jail, the whole family does the sentence. So think about each of those 2.3 million spiraling outwards into millions more people suffering from this system. And then even after they're released, um, referring to kind of second class citizenry, various writers in, in, in this collection refer to the inability to in any way move on, not just from because of the trauma they've experienced, just because society will, will not grant you a kind of productive role um, if you have a criminal record. So I know you've both done some re-entry work and could you talk about the way the, the injury just keeps repeating itself over time? Well, I, I think, I mean, obviously there's a lot of obstacles in, peop in, in, in people's way. I mean, having a felony conviction is kind of a permanent stigma. It affects your, it impacts your ability to access employment, it impacts your ability to access education, housing, um, and all of those things. I mean, I think I might want to just take that a little bit to some of the stuff that's happening in Illinois at the moment. And I want to refer to two, to two pieces that are kind of in the, in the political debate. I mean, one is the, the, the question of getting release for people who have life sentences. Illinois has no, has no parole system. And so people who get a life sentence do life. So they don't even get the pleasure of being out and, and dealing with, these, with, these, uh, with the challenges that people have when, they, when they're released from prison. And, I, and there's, a, there's a campaign going on. I know Alice can talk about this if people want to talk to her afterwards or we can have a conversation to, get, to, to establish parole in Illinois to get these people who have life sentences uh, a, a way out. But for people who do come out, uh, I want to talk about the other issue that I'm, that I'm actively uh, engaged in, and that's the question of electronic monitoring or incarceration. We have about 2,700 people right now in Illinois who have completed their prison sentence in Illinois, and they're now on electronic monitors. And when they're on electronic monitor, they're under house arrest. Typically, in the people that I deal with, they're only allowed out of the house three days a week. The rest of the time, they're just locked in the house with this technological device. Um, and they have to get permission from their parole agent to go anywhere. And, and these are grown people. You know, these are people who, who might have done 15, 20 years in prison. These are people that might have the university degrees that, that they've picked up in university in, in prison, and now they can't, they can't go to the store. They can't walk around the block. They can't walk their kid to school because they have this device. And I think, I think this technology, this e-carceration, is something we have to think about, not simply because it impacts only people coming out of prison or people who are on pretrial release, but, you know, you, you all got smartphones. You all are getting tracked. That information's all going somewhere. Who's got it? Who's got it? And what good things are they doing with that information when they get it? I can't imagine that there's many. They're trying to sell you stuff. I know that. But for people who have been in the system, when they get your data, that has a whole lot of more serious implications. So I think the, the electronic monitoring is but, is but one of the obstacles, but there's, there, there's, 
so many of them when you just carry when you just carry this 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 stigma um, now there's beginning to be a lot more awareness of this there's beginning to be there's a lot of campaigns around the right to vote for example I um, mean in Florida they pass legislation and that's happening in other states so there is there is uh, energy to deal with this but once again when we look at the scale of the problem and the pace of the change the, it's a, it's still a mismatch yeah, to jump on that, and especially because we've been talking about the use of language, when I first started doing this work, which is around like 2000, well, um, doing, I started in like 1990. I was one of those people, when, I, when you could hold a, this meeting in an elevator, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> was right? They used to call what the, the issues that happened when you left prison collateral consequences. And you know, after about five minutes of working on this, you're like, there's nothing collateral about these consequences. These are built in and are very intentional. Um, and they, they, you know, as you said, they encompass your access to being able to go to education, to public housing, um, and, that, and, and your access to public housing that will then, quite frankly, impact your ability to live with your family members, because if you've one member of the family who's been convicted, you could all lose um, your public housing, right? So that's turning families upon families. Issues about you know, voting, we all know, and issues about um, what jobs you can hold. I mean, it's state by state, but it's really very comprehensive. So one thing we kind of changed it and was to post-conviction consequences. Uh, because, but it's, this, it's a huge web of, of regulations that basically put you in a situation where as many of my friends from inside will say when you get out, basically, you're, and these are mostly people come to women's prisons, basically your only option is to go back to, you know, working, walking the street or, or slinging drugs because all the other options have been foreclosed to you. And even to just finally just say, jumping on that Florida thing, you know, we were all so happy, right, when that passed saying that folks who had felony convictions could vote. And then, like, what was it, two weeks ago, and the Florida legislature is like, yeah, but we're going to put all these crazy-ass restrictions on here so that really we're not giving you back the right to vote, which was, again, that point of the intentionality of this from a many of, um, you know, basic, our, our ruling system that, like, people, the people actually voted, I mean, that was stunning to me, um, to change this law. And then the, the legislature is like, nah. Um, and that just really, there's just a lot of challenges in putting your life together, putting aside you know, everything else. Talk about that for hours. Something you said, James, about the kind of people who, who are trying to understand our country from the outside, just being at a loss. I have a friend who says, in this country, if you don't know the answer to a question, the answer is money. And, and you, I think you called them prison profiteers, or maybe, I hope I'm getting that right. And could you talk a little bit about the role that <laughs> profit has played and, and continues to play in all this? Well, I mean, you know, we refer to this sometimes as the prison industrial complex, and there's a lot of industries that make a lot of money off prisons, and I think there's a lot of industries that have become, you know, institutionalized, and they become part of the system that keeps it, that keeps it going. Uh, however, I, I, I want to make, make a note, and that is, I think we pay way too much attention to private prisons, and particularly for anybody in Illinois to talk about private prisons. I'm sorry, we don't have any private prisons in Illinois. And, but I'm telling you, these prisons aren't any better than, the private, than most of the private prisons. So I don't think we should necessarily think of the private prisons as, the, as, as, as a primary evil, but it's the people who are in the prison business, and most of them are state actors. But they are also making money out of this. Some people are making money out of this. Many people are getting careers out of this. I mean, prison, the, prison, the, the prison guards that, that, that um, supervised me in California, there was, a, in, in, I think it was 2014, there was over uh, 4,000 of them that made over $100,000 a year. They work double, they work 60, 70, 80 hours a week, all these overtime scams. So there's, but, but then you have the, 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 the real, the companies that profit off of healthcare, off of transportation, off of electronic monitoring devices, off of the phone calls, the video visitation is a new, is a new form of technology. And then you also see that the company like Securus, for example, which is a major prison phone company, they're like, they're, they, they, they have a whole range of products. So they do video visitation, they do prison phones, they do prison administrative systems for, uh, for um, 
the, you know, the, the management, information management systems for prison. They also do electronic monitors. So they, they're, they're diversified. They're, they're he hedging their bets, spreading their risks in the prison industrial complex. So I, I think we have to realize that it's a complex political economy. Um, it's not just about the private prisons. I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I hate private prisons. And I hate George Zoli, the, the CEO of the, of the uh, of the GEO group, mm, I, I would like to see him come here and have a conversation with us, but he was too busy trying to get them to name the stadium after his company at the, in, 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 in Florida. So anyway, um, I think th th these private prison companies are a part of a whole family of companies that make, that make money, and they're, they're part of the bigger prison industrial complex, which includes all the people in, this, in the government, local and state government and federal government, that make money off of this and make their livelihood off of this. A lot of the attention is given to this, what's called the school to prison pipeline, but it also seems like there's a poverty to prison pipeline, and I think that that was certainly a theme running through um, the writer's accounts in, in your book. Absolutely, there is absolutely a poverty to prison pipeline because there are no opportunities in our neighborhoods. I mean, putting aside that there's no real educational opportunities, there's no job opportunities, and you're really dealing with this structural system that you can maybe cobble together three jobs at three different um, fast food restaurants, and that's the only way you can survive. And you know what we really saw is that so many of these folks um, you know, and, and I have to say, like a lot of people who are in prison for for murder did not actually kill anyone. I think I think people should know that. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it comes as a surprise to some folks. And a lot of it's just being part of your neighborhood, answering the phone, you know, but and, and living living your life in this neighborhood that's under the microscope of the government, and that's just going to make you much more likely to be put inside. Um, I always just, you know, when I was having babies way long ago, um, one of my friends was saying, oh, for labor, you should, like, smoke some weed beforehand, and, and that'll be really helpful. I mean, first of all, I was like, what? Um, I don't know. But I was just like, have you up and lost your mind? I'm like a woman of color. If I go in to give birth, there's, like, a 99.9% .9 chance someone's going to drug test me. And, and that's gonna be the end of that. So it's, it's a lot of it is like the lack of opportunity, but also a lot of it is just the eye of the state is on you all the time. And that becomes an awareness of your life. Just like I was like, I mean, it just never would have occurred to me to do that. I was just like, and none of you people, oh, you know. Anyway, I'm sorry. Um, I know we're supposed to go to Q&A, so yeah, I will no longer ramble on. <laughs> I'm being told to take questions from the audience, so make them good, and there's a microphone. So we've spoken a bit about um, Angela Davis having been here, I think, yesterday. And this is her on prison abolition from your book, James. Um, the prison, therefore, functions ideologically as an abstract site into which undesirables are deposited. This is to your point. Relieving us of the responsibility of thinking about the real issues affecting those communities from which prisoners are drawn in such disproportionate numbers. This is the ideological work that the prison performs. It relieves us of the responsibility of seriously engaging with the problems of our society, especially those produced by racism and increasingly global capitalism. And so she's in favor of prison abolition. Is there, do you see that movement catching any kind of <laughs> traction or, or where do you see this struggle going forward the next five years? Because I think the last five years, despite my general pessimism about life, have, have, has resulted in some positive steps. Yeah, there's some, something happened in Washington a couple of years ago. I don't I'm not, we don't talk about that. <laughs> um, so I think, I mean, I think among, certainly amongst people who are active in these issues, the idea of, of prison abolition is gaining a lot of traction, that people are really seeing that it's about uh, an ideological framework, it's about a philosophical approach to solving social problems and that 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 we need a, a as Angela Davis called it, a paradigm shift we need to we need to be thinking in a different way I personally don't support prison abolition I support abolition 
And abolition to me means freedom, it means restructuring the inequalities of, of US capitalism of which mass incarceration is a, is a subset of that. And I think when we start thinking about, when we, th when we think about abolition, we're thinking about freedom in a much broader sense than just getting rid of prisons. Yes, we need to get rid of prisons and jails, but we have to think about how are we going to restructure the, 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 rest of the, uh, the rest of the economy in a way that's, that, that, that's, that's much more about justice. And for those of you who are mm, getting rid of prisons, I don't want to do that. That seems too extreme. What about, uh, what about uh, Dylan Roof? What I, say, what, what I say is this. Let's not worry about Dylan Roof now. Let's, let's struggle and let's reduce the prison population by 75%. And we, when we get to that point, we'll talk about Dylan Roof. And I can guarantee you by the time we get to that point, we're living in a different country. Um, I, um, the organization that um, Sherry Dwight, the narrator I read from, mentioned Justice Now is where I worked um, for many, many years. And that was a openly abolitionist organization. And, and, and to your point, Sergio, for many years, you'd be like, you'd just like try to whisper it. You're like, please, abolition, you know, let me on the podium, even though you think I'm a total crackpot. Um, you know, literally. <laughs> and, and definitely, that has changed. That's been a huge sea change that you can now, I've, I've had people saying, I'm for prison abolition. And I just like. And, and, and you know, to give credit the, where it's due, I think Angela Davis mentions it for the first time in like 2004. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it definitely Angela Davis has been the one, you know, you know, who's, you know, I mean, there's been a lot of pieces. And we had Ruthie Gilmore in the New York Times Magazine like two weeks ago. I almost fell off my chair for that too. Um, and, I, and I think, yes, the point is also that when you think about prison abolition or you think about abolition, it's not like we're saying we're just going to like snap our fingers and tomorrow we're getting rid of all prisons and jails. It's really thinking about, again, where do we want to put our resources, right? Do we want to put our resources into prisons and into like paying salaries of more than $100,000 for guards, which is, which is very um, consistent for what we see in California. When a town is, a rural town is really struggling, the government promises them a prison. So rather than doing that, we start putting more money into education, right? Into actually provi providing real education to our youth into healthcare, into providing support to, to people who are struggling with, um, with sexual abuse or with trauma or with illness or with any of those pieces. If we start um, putting money into actually trying to address issues around childhood sexual abuse rather than, again, just tossing people in jail and, and locking them away. If we start putting money into our neighborhoods and building up jobs and communities and local businesses and all of those pieces, then we're gonna start seeing a sea change and, you know, and then putting on with that, can we stop locking people up for having mental illness? You can't imagine the number of people who are inside for that and changing that up and putting together a real mental health system. And then the next step, if you stop incarcerating people for being addicted to drugs, right, and you actually gave them real um, drug rehab rehabilitation and real support rather than throwing, a, throwing them away in jail, you'd see a really huge reduction. And that's not even counting locking the people around who quite frankly were standing in the wrong place at the wrong time and are inside. And I definitely, I would say well, one of the things, I mean, I, I should have said this when you said that, but many of the folks inside, especially women's prisons, are there for crimes of survival. Crimes of survival. Um, and those are, those are drug crimes, those are check forgeries, and um, just pieces like that. If we eliminated all those folks, I think we'd be at your 75%. And then we can really deal with, with some of the Dylan Roofs but let's let's you know take care of the low hanging fruit right now and put our money where it yeah, should. Yeah, don't be. let anybody kid you. The vast majority of people incarcerated in this country have not done anything violent. Vast, vast majority. And that's. I think we had a brave soul there. <laughs> uh, good evening. Um, now, when it comes to the question of incarceration, there in the United States, we all know there's really two camps. Um, the first camp is obviously the status quo or harsher camp, uh, which really reflects some of the reactionary tendencies we see in this country. And to be more honest, it's not just the reactionary tendencies, but it's organized reactionary activism. On the other hand, we have progressive activism, uh, but the difference between progressive activism or progressive struggles of, let's say the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and the progressive struggles of today is up until maybe the 80s, 
maybe the 90s. Um, I wasn't alive then, so I'm not sure about when exactly it started. Uh, but you really had a lot of um, a lot of very specific interests or interest groups uh, start to create reactionary activist groups that really serve to uh, counter progressive groups. So for instance, during the civil rights movement, it was really progressive activism against ingrained societal or ingrained social, um, I don't want to say norms, but I just want to say an ingrained social status quo or societal status quo, whereas today you're really going up against a machine. And a really good example would be Alabama with its recent abortion law uh, or its recent anti-abortion law where uh, it's less than 25% of Alabamans. James. Um, well, I, I, think, I, I think one of the ways we deal with that is to think about how we build a broader movement. Because you're talking about abortion over here and mass incarceration over here. We need, we need to connect the struggle against mass incarceration to the other social justice struggles. I mean, I was alive, believe it or not, as young as I look, I was alive back in those days. And um, uh, then we had, we had organizations, but we also had something that was called the movement. And the movement brought together people who fought against the war, for black liberation, for a whole range of social justice issues. And there was a, I, I'm, one of the examples I, I use is that when I went on a, uh, it, when I went on these, I, when I went on demonstrations about prisons in, in back in, when was that, 1825, I think, back then? When I went on those demonstrations, um, I could almost guarantee that everybody in that demonstration had been on an anti-war demonstration. Now, I can almost guarantee uh, amongst, if I'm in a room full of people dealing with mass incarceration, most of them haven't done anything about the wars. It's, a, it's over here. So I think, I mean, and, to, and, you're, and I think to your point, these far-right organizations, these neo-fascist organizations, they're connecting their dots. They're hitting on all the buttons, and we're and we're trying to fight them issue by issue because we don't have a way of bringing those, the, you know, the struggles and the organizations together. So it's about it's thinking about the kind of organizations we can form to fight that because otherwise they're going to pick us off one by one. Yeah, I, I can't agree more. I mean, I think one of the things that we have to do is we really have to work on being united if we are going to be fighting what is a very very organized opposition. And I mean, that's one of the things, one of the reasons I became so passionate about working on issues in women's prisons because it did connect all of that. Like when you said that abortion and, and mass incarceration is connected, I'm like, what are you kidding me? Hugely connected. Um, not just because now we are making laws that basically criminalize pregnancy and criminalize pregnant people. Um, it's been connected for a, a while because it is used as um, one of the things that I argues that prisons are a tool of reproductive oppression. And they're used as a tool of reproductive oppression very kind of consciously. But it's not just that, it's also as we talked about, it's education, it's health, it's our communities, it's war, right? And it's really making that connections. And, and this is just not what you asked, but James kind of opened it. I'm gonna get in my soapbox for a second. I think that progressives need to spend less time fighting each other and more time fighting the enemy. We are way over time, and I could sense the tension in the room. You want me to keep going? You're in charge. Okay, one more. Hi. Um, I, um, 
I have to say two things. I think the first one is about you know people who have mental issues being locked up. I know that our Cook County Sheriff, Tom Dart, has gone on television a lot stating that over half of the people that are being locked up in Cook County are people with mental problems. And uh, I have to agree with that 1,000%. However, I think this idea of prison ab abolition is nuts. And I'll tell you why. Because we need to protect people who are really dangerous to society. Think of, example, John Wayne Gacy, Charlie Manson, Jeffrey Dahmer. Just today here in the Chicago area, for those of you from Chicago, there was stories on the news all over the place. A young woman was murdered, a baby ripped out of her womb, and all sorts of trish stuff. I mean, if you give a person, well, what's the alternative? Give these people a free trip to Disneyland? I mean, we need to be realistic about this. There's really dangerous people out there that need to be kept away from society. The only place to put these people are in prison or frying, one of the two. Well, as, as I said before, you're, you're certainly not the first person to call me a Looney Tune. So um, I'm comfortable with that. Some of them are my own children. Um, but uh, not on this issue, on others. I think that, I mean, I think that your point that there are really dangerous people out there doing very horrible things is of course true, but that doesn't really speak to the issue about prison abolition. Because the issue is, as we said, first of all, is that if you think about it, the vast majority of people in prison, there are better options. You just said that 50% of people that, you, that are in Cook County Jail are probably there for mental illness, right? And so that's 50% that's that we can take care of in a different way. And then if you think about people who are there for crimes of survival, if we can really work and, and I'm not saying, let's, like I said, I, I must be clear, I'm not saying let's just open the doors, let's just let things happen, because we don't have, a, our society's not set up to deal with like anybody coming out of anywhere at this point of time. We have no, so, we don't have a functioning social system. So, but, I, but if you, and then if we take people out, we set things up so people are no longer doing crimes of survival, let's look at the, that number. And then again, like as I said, if we start dealing with the people who are in prison for quite frankly, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't know what the percentage is that's a John Wayne Gacy and what have you, but it's not gonna be a very big percentage. And to actually, to jump past that point, to be honest, I think that John Wayne Gacy, whatever his name is, I'm sorry, I'm terrible about this, it was quite insane and, and should have been in a mental institution. I mean, and so I think that what you're talking about is, it is a hard question. What do we do? Once we get rid of all the low-hanging fruit, once we do the easy shit, what do we do after that? But I think we're a really, really long ways from getting to the difficult questions. I, I, would, be, I would throw a party, like a huge, like a size of a wedding, if we were at the point where I'm worrying about people who are chronically dangerous we got there, I mean, that would be, that would be a huge win for our country. I mean, I've never heard anyone who supports prison abolition say, the first thing we gotta do is get Dylan Roof out of prison. I mean, that's just not, that's not even on the radar. What we're talking about is, how do we, A, create a society where we don't produce Dylan Roofs? I mean, look at all these, you know, all these mass shootings and school shootings. I mean, these things are not, these things are not aberrations. They're a product of a, of a social fabric that produces these kinds of ma m mainly young white men that, that, are, that are in love with guns. Um, so we need, to, we need to address some of those problems. And when we start, think, and we st when we start thinking about that, we're going to start thinking about how we solve other problems in other ways, as you've, as you've elaborated. It really is it's a philosophical shift, and I think I think literature, to bring it back to, the, to our home here, literature, so one of the most important things literature does for us is it gives us the capacity to imagine. To imagine a future that's different and to imagine what the past was like, not necessarily accepting that dominant narrative of the past, but it could have been very different than what we think it is. So I think, I think you know, we need to find ways to spark that imagination because we are stuck in the shit here. We think that, this, that it's always been like this and it's, it's impossible to change. And as long as we have that attitude, it will stay like that. But for some people, it's really unacceptable to keep on like this. So 
let's, let's find new ways of looking at things and build new organizations that are capable of taking on those challenges. Okay, now we really are out of time. Thanks to the University of Chicago, National Book Foundation, but mostly thanks to you two, not just for being here tonight, but for producing such important works um, that I think drive the conversation forward. Thanks again. Thank you. Great.